Hi everyone and welcome back to Coachy TV. In this video we're going to take our first look at workouts that are really specific to the specific prep phase of your cross country um, macro cycle. It would also be important in this phase for your track season but most of the world is getting ready for cross country here. We're dealing with uh, the important workouts and the first one here is the extensive tempo workout. Um, and there's a really specific reason why I picked this one to be first that you'll see in this presentation. What we really want to think about here when we're dealing with extensive tempo workouts is how does this specific workout start the timetable on anaerobic peaking windows? In the previous videos where we talked about general prep, we were talking about how you just pretty much focus on the aerobic system as well as the alactic system because the timetables for those peaking is twice as long as the anaerobic glycolytic system. Well, now that we're getting into specific prep, the second half of your training year, the timetable needs to start for that, for this you know, third energy system that we really kind of put by the wayside. That way, your aerobic system peaks. The alactic system never really peaks, but you know, get it as good as you can for the one season. And the anaerobic glycolytic system peaking at the same time for the most important means, whatever you deem that being. For for this presentation purposes, we've been dealing with um, the state meet, which here in Florida um, is November 7th. So we're trying to see how this, starting it now with specific prep, how is that going to start the timetable on the anaerobic peaking windows and why that's important for right now when you're choosing to start doing these. And how do these workouts, extensive tempos, help transition to more intense work? What you'll see from this when we look at the actual um, fictitious mac uh, macro cycle for specific prep here, um, you don't do a lot of these. You do them at very specific reasons for a specific time. Kind of like if you saw the previous video, which I'll put in the description down below, medium hill intervals, which transitions between general prep and um, specific prep, they're meant to be more of a bridge. You know, get things started, get you ready for more intense work, and then also these can be done for sort of placeholders a little bit later on, and I'll show you how that all works out also. The picture here is our 2017 um, boys cross country team from Wharton High School. Um, when we made it back to the state meet in back to back years, they made it in 16 and they've made it every year since then. After not advancing out of districts for the eight years prior to, it would have been the year before this team. So that was the 2016 team. And that's the idea is you want to keep in mind your state meet where this picture is being taken here. And that's really dictating the timetable. If you're just sort of randomly deciding, I feel like starting it now, well, you're kind of going in blind. It might work. It, if you're really, really lucky, but you really want to essentially look at where this actually takes place in terms of your actual, um, whatever your situation is for what you're peaking towards. So let's go ahead and get right to it. I'm Kyle Giacono, the head boys cross country and track coach at Wharton High School in Tampa, Florida, and I have been for the last seven years. If you look like a closer look at my credentials, they are on the screen. Okay, so this slide probably looks familiar with a few changes from the previous workouts when we were looking at uh, general prep workouts that were important and essentially all the things that were critically important and important for general prep still apply for specific prep. Now we're going to change the ones that were over here to the right from not important to quite important. So we still need to understand that this is getting ready for the cross country um, 5k and the long run is still critical as well as the VO2 max run which includes testing and the recovery runs. These workouts are um, critically important to success in developing key factors um, needed for success in the cross country 5k. They focus on improving VO2 max, max, both central and peripheral. Okay, so just because this video is talking about new workouts doesn't mean that the new workouts are more important. The critical ones are still the critical ones, and I'll put links to all the videos on these workout types in the description down below, as well as these important workouts, which are the alactic run, hill runs, which are strength ones, they were short hill intervals in general prep, and then, as I said, medium and hills transition between general prep and specific prep and would eventually become long hill intervals as you're transitioning from specific prep into the pre-comp phase and then your tempo runs, the lactic threshold runs. These workouts are still very important to cross-country success, but less so than the critical workouts. They focus mainly on running economy and specific strength. Okay, so as I mentioned, these should still have their same level of importance that they had in general prep. Okay, we just need to now add to it with these ones that, again, were not important in general prep. Okay, now we're going to call these quite important workouts. And the reason why I'll just say they're quite important versus important is just to emphasize the fact that you have to start doing them now. You can't put this off for another, you know, three or four weeks. You know, you can't wait till the end of specific prep. Part of specific prep is specifically getting ready for the demands of the race. That's the difference between general prep, which is, um, you know, that 
generally getting ready for more intense work and specific prep which is specifically getting ready for the demands right general prep is just general fitness specific prep is specific uh, specific fitness for the race that you're dealing with and that's why these become quite important here because there is an anaerobic contribution to the 5k cross country race so now we have to have all this put in together the critical ones the important ones and the quite important ones and these quite important ones are special endurance which will come later intensive tempo which is a little bit more intense than what we're dealing with today and really what i'll say when i start getting into special endurance and intensive tempo it's sort of a gray line i think in cross country it's more about pacing and things like that so these kind of blend together and then what we're dealing with here today the extensive tempo which acts to start um, getting things ready for this more intense work. These workouts cause improvements in the anaerobic glycolytic system, exposing the body to acid. Okay, They focus on creating adaptations to buffer this acid, reducing or delaying fatigue. Okay, So the critical ones focus on VO2 max, important ones focus on running economy and specific strength. All these ones that we're adding to now is creating the adaptations so your body can buffer the acid that comes with the anaerobic glycolytic system being increased in importance in the workout or really more importantly that we're dealing with is the race that we're dealing with. And the reason you want to do that is to reduce or delay fatigue. Really, it's delaying fatigue because this is eventually what is going to stop them in the cross country 5K. And just to a better job of uh, emphasizing that, that point here, your macro cycle has five parts. The first part being the transition, which is your rest and recovery from the, uh, the period before. Make sure that you are also accounting for that. You don't want to just blow through rest and recovery. I have a video in the description down below that talks about that. And then the four other parts are about the training part of your macro cycle. So general prep, as I mentioned, is prepping for more intense work. We're dealing with specific prep here, which is specifically preparing for the demands of the race. We're getting ourselves then ready for the pre-competitive phase, which is prepping for the most important meets. The hardest workouts happen in pre-comp um, because they're, you know, about four weeks before the end of the, you know, well, say they're four week block before the final four week block. So say eight to five to eight weeks before the end. And we deal with adaptation and in in two to four week blocks. So basically you want your hardest workouts to be in pre-comp so that you can be at your best in the competitive phase. And the competitive phase is just about big time races. So just to articulate that, that's what specific prep is all about. And again, this is the emphasis shift from general prep where we're just preparing for more intense work. Now we're really specifically preparing for the demands. And that's why we have to account for the anaerobic glycolytic system now. The way this slide meant is set up, it looks like it's equal parts. And for those of you that watch the general preparation videos, you'll know that these are not equal in terms of length. General prep is about half of your calendar of your of your training part of your calendar year. Um, in this presentation series, I say of the 23 weeks that you have from the time that we started in the fictitious macro cycle to November 7th, I put 11 weeks in general prep and a 23 week program. So just about half, or just under half. But the whole point of this looking similar or equal parts on this, this slide is the idea that all these parts have very specific reasons for doing them. They have very specific, they're equal in importance. They're not equal in length, right? Specific prep is only working if you had general prep before it and you know it lets you get into pre-comp. And this is why you do all those miles in general prep so that you can be ready for what we're gonna be showing you here in this specific prep video series, starting with extensive tempo, dealing with intensive tempo and special endurance and all these things that we've been neglecting intentionally in general prep. Okay, so let's, we talked about the specific um, demands of the race in specific prep. Let's really look at that um, in detail here. Um, the cross country 5K, the race metrics of the 5K. So the study that I refer to quite often, it was just a groundbreaking study. It's just fantastic. I would definitely recommend um, see, uh, searching it out because it's just really fascinating everything they did. Um, published in 2008 by Ingham. Um, and they looked at a bunch of different races. They looked at the 1500, they looked at the 5K, the they looked at the 800, they looked at the, the 10K. Those are the four races they looked at. And they were really just trying to figure out why did somebody win and somebody not win. And they looked at a bunch of different things. And with, with the 5K, it was very clear that whoever had the best VO2 max or who could run fastest aerobically won the 5K 94.3% of the time. It's why we spent all that time in general prep dealing with central VO2 max and peripheral VO2 max and all these different things in the description, a video in the description down below and all those things. Um, but it's not 100%. And one of the reasons about the not being 100% is we don't just produce energy aerobically. Let's um, go ahead and move forward with the fact that 
So we've got race-specific VO2 max is from USATF distance curriculum. Um, we'll find that the 5K is run at 97% of VO2 max. VO2 max is usually your, your two-mile pace or about how far you can go in 10 minutes. So the fact that the 5K is you know, pretty close in distance to the 3,200 meter or the two mile. That's probably why there's that close association with race pace being just slightly slower than VO2 max and the wind predictor. That makes perfect sense. And now is really the important part for the discussion here is the race energy supply share. Another fantastic study that was uh, published in 2008 by Dr. Matter and Dr. Hartman. They work closely with IAAF. And they really looked at not just, you know, at the end of a, a, a race or something like that and, and counting, you know, calories that were burned or measuring lactate level. They were really in a second by second measuring where energy was being produced by humans over various races. And when they looked at the 5K, 4% of the energy in the race at race pace. If you walk a 5K, it's going to be almost 100% aerobic or 99% aerobic. But at race pace, which is all we're really dealing with here, the ATP phosphocretin system or the collectively called the alactic system produces 4% of the energy the aerobic system produces 86% of the energy makes sense and it takes twice as long so that's why we focus on that all through general prep and we're going to continue to focus on it in specific prep pre-comp and comp but that 10% there that anaerobic glycolytic system 10% is nothing you want to just throw away so you really need to think about the fact that 10% of the race, so even if you do if you do everything perfectly with the alactic system and the aerobic system, you're only going to get a 90. That's pretty good, but we're trying to get to 100% here. We're trying to be the best we can be, and specific prep is where we're going to start targeting this anaerobic glycolytic system here so we can get everything maximized as much as possible. The law of training specificity, it says that every training session that you put yourself through or who you're training has a specific effect on that athlete, right? You do workout A, adaptation A is going to happen, right? If you do workout A, adaptation B is not going to happen, right? That's just, it makes perfect sense. If you do this, this is going to result. It makes, you know, perfect sense if you really kind of break it down like that. Specific training um, stimulus creates a specific effect, right? Your body's not going to be adapted to something you're not exposing it to. If you're never exposed to, I'll just use the example here in Tampa, Florida, we've had heat advisories the last few days. We've made it to 99 degrees. Um, yesterday, which was June 27th, which is the second highest temperature ever recorded in Tampa, um, our bodies here in Tampa, Florida are not going to be adapted to, say, 30 degree temperature. We're just not being exposed to it at that point. And think of it the same way with your training session. You have to expose yourself to something to get that specific effect. And more importantly, that training effect, that specific effect on the athlete, which, which may or may not be a desired effect, right? Which may or may not be desired. So just because you're doing a workout, workout A may create effect A, but effect A may not be good when you're looking at the whole race here. So that's kind of an important thing. You have to understand the race metrics. You need to understand the law of specificity. And you also have to understand who you're training too. If you're dealing with somebody who's super fast in their anaerobic glycolytic system, if they can, you know, as a maybe a high school boy pop off a 49 second uh, 400, well, maybe you don't have to do as much with the anaerobic glycolytic system. But in general, this is what you need to be targeting now. You know, if you have somebody who's an aerobic monster who can't go, you know, maybe you've got a kid that can go, you know, in their two mile, they're like a 930 kid, but in their 400, they can only go 55. You probably need to do a little more work than you would think just looking at that. So those are the three things. Know the race demands, understand the law of training specificity, and you do need to know your, your yourself or whoever it is you're training there to put all those three pieces together. What we're dealing with here is how will extensive tempo improve anaerobic glycolytic fitness, that 10%, okay, to increase the overall success in this race? And will this negatively impact our aerobic fitness? Is by focusing on this, are we going to lose any aerobic fitness by not doing enough aerobic work? Or is there something about this type of training that can cause a loss of aerobic fitness? Those are things that we're gonna kinda continue to look through as we go through this presentation. Okay, so where do extensive tempo workouts fit in? This is our energy continuum based on VO2 max, courtesy of USA um, track and field distance curriculum. General prep, we were dealing basically with VO2 max and to the right, our aerobic power workouts, our lactic threshold, our aerobic threshold workouts, or long and recovery runs, and then our alactic runs, um, which I recommend doing as fly 30s. Your hill runs are also gonna have to deal with um, basically this energy system. Now that we're dealing with specific prep, we're filling in the gaps from, from VO2 max aerobic power to the left, where they meet up with the alactic system. This whole area that's called the combined zone, it's called that because it's combining both the aerobic system and the anaerobic system in a, a, a similar fashion. Whereas down here, the aerobic system, the anaerobic glycolytic system is working. It's just not 
in, it's not producing a significant amount of the energy. Anything in the combined zone here, and the reason you eventually have to stop is acid accumulation. Um, so VO2 max or aerobic power um, workouts do produce some acid. It's the reason why you eventually have to stop, but it's not high enough to where your body really makes any of these changes that we're going to deal with later on when we talk about why you're doing this in the timetables you're dealing with. So we'll see that extensive tempo is right in here, and it's 70% to 80% best effort. So it's not that it's not that challenging, right? So um, extensive tempo, as you'll see here, it also includes aerobic power, right? This whole area, VO2 max, and actually this is an old... Um, old chart that should be updated. It should actually say 98 to 101 percent is training right at VO2 max or aerobic power. You'll see that extensive tempo, it includes aerobic power workouts, but it also includes those slightly faster and slower. So extensive tempo is anything from about 92 percent all the way up to about 108 percent. So basically anything above lactic threshold, it makes perfect sense for that to be um, something that's slightly different because anything above lactic threshold and your body is accumulating lactate or more importantly the acid and then once you get past 108 percent you're getting to something that's called intensive tempo which is much um, significantly um, more intense and it's basically akin to your 1500 meter or 1600 meter pace so that's what we'll find with extensive tempo this is a term that your sprint coach is going to use quite a bit um, it's when they might call their tempo 200s or tempo 400s. That's what we're dealing with here. And it basically includes the same pace that you were doing your, your VO2 max aerobic power intervals during general prep. And you're still going to be doing during this time frame, your thousands, your 1200s, maybe your 800s um, and your miles, those types of things. But when we're dealing with extensive tempo with a distance runner who's already been doing this kind of work through general prep and VO2 max in a very targeted way at that 98 to 101 percent for peripheral VO2 max development which I talk about in a video in the description down below we're probably gonna want to target something different because otherwise you're just training the same thing right so keep that in the back of your mind um, this is moderate anaerobic glycolytic paces As you can see 70 to 80 percent best effort but it will cause acid to build as they are above lactic threshold, so I already mentioned that. And as I mentioned, we're already doing this, so probably what you've already decided in your mind that you're going to end up targeting with this, and I think it makes a lot of sense, is more this outer end, because as you can see, we're going to be linking extensive tempo into intensive tempo, and eventually special one and special two. So we're going to be working from VO2 max aerobic power outward as we get either yourself or the athlete you're training more used to the acid levels um, so that your, their body can buffer it and more used to this type of faster pace as they go out to special endurance one. You will notice that speed endurance is already out here and I have not spoken about this in any of the presentations on cross country and um, I don't think I've actually spoken about it in any one I've done because I've really focused on over the last year just focusing on two mile and 1600 meter runners also in track. This would be a, a pace speed endurance that is very important for an 800 meter runner or an 816 in that order or a four 800 meter kid. It's really not important for cross country 5k. Um, you get everything you need with the fly 30s and the special endurance one. Um, check back when we get more to the track season and I will start doing a couple presentations on the differences between your kids that are more 800 meter focus and your kids that are more 3200 meter focus. There are things that they can do together but you also if you want to maximize both you really need to separate those groups and this is one of the reasons why but that's not what we're talking about here today we're talking about uh, extensive tempo so let's continue okay so this is the important thing to kind of consider here this is what we're really trying to train okay acid accumulation in workouts this is the key factor that separates specific prep workouts from general prep workouts any workout intensity above lactic threshold, about 85% VVO2 max, has the potential to accumulate acid. If you run, like we said, 92%, um, which is something we've talked about previously called critical velocity, if you just do you know, a mile or two with that, which I actually recommend for certain kids, um, tempo workout video in the description down below, um, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to have it up high enough to where your body's going to make a bunch of changes for it. You do critical velocity or 10k um, pace for 10k well now that is going to make some changes with um with that energy system so it it does kind of has the potential for it depends on how long you do it it's the reason why you know vo2 max intervals you know it's not going to really hurt you doing them through general prep it's definitely going to help you you absolutely need it but um it's not doing enough of it to really make a bunch of changes right because you've got the interval factor and all those different things but just understand that anything above lactic threshold your body will accumulate some level of acid because that's what lactic threshold is it's the 
threshold at which lactate starts to accumulate. So keep that in mind. It is wrong to say, and I mentioned this earlier, that acid producing system ever actually turns off. The acid producing system being anaerobic glycolytic system. It never actually turns on. You know, it's like, oh, your body's like, oh, well, you started running above lactic threshold, so let me flip the switch and turn it. That's not, that's not the way the human body works. Your body is always kind of trying to produce energy because if you don't have energy, if you don't have ATP, you will die, right? Your body actually will never let you drop below about 60% ATP because it gives you that huge buffer there um, in between to make sure that nothing goes wrong. So this system is always on. Um, it's always working, but when it is working harder for an extended period or with reduced rest, so you could do fly 30s, and I say you have to give yourself three minutes rest, at least on those, otherwise you're going to be working anaerobic glycolytic, you give yourself one minute rest, well now you are going to start to produce acid even in those workouts too, so it's going to be working harder for extended period, you know, faster pace, longer extent, or if you're not giving yourself enough rest, then the acid can build, okay, so that's the idea behind this. Mitochondria can clear acid using electron transport chain. I have a video in the description down below that talks about um, aerobic pace summaries. I really go into this in detail, but basically one of the ways that your mitochondria produce energy aerobically is through this thing called the electron transport chain. Okay, it produces ATP as part of aerobic respiration. It's most of it. It produces about you know 80 to 90 percent of the energy, and it's using the acid that's created from the anaerobic glycolytic system. So really, this is a perfect system. Your anaerobic glycolytic system produces energy and the hydrogen ions that the mitochondria then clear for even more energy production. So when in unison, these work perfectly. Your mitochondria can't do anything without these free acid radicals, okay? The one problem though with aerobic respiration and this electron transport chain especially, it's very complex, very complex and a slow process. It's very efficient. It uses one molecule of ATP, uh, one molecule, excuse me, of fuel, either fat or carbohydrate, or in dire situation, protein. Your body doesn't like to do that, but it could. And it takes one molecule of that, and it produces, between the electron transport chain and something called the Krebs cycle, 36 molecules of ATP, so it's very efficient. Anaerobic glycolytic takes one molecule of, of fuel and produces two molecules of ATP, but it's faster, so that's kind of the trade-off here. So because the mitochondria and aerobic respiration is complex and slow, acid usually outpaces it, especially in these workouts. Not an aerobic threshold, not in lactic threshold, um, in any workouts where you have the rest period in between, but in something like this, extensive tempo or anything else, um, the acid production, it outpaces what the mitochondria can clear, and that's where the acid accumulates. And the issue is that little guy off to the side. So if you ever wanted to know, this is what lactic acid looks like, okay? Your body, this is one of the waste products of anaerobic glycolytic energy production. Your body produces this in the cytoplasm of the cell, so it doesn't have to go into the mitochondria. It's another reason why it's faster, because it's just kind of, it's very available just anywhere in the cells. This lasts for about a quarter second in your body, so it's not the lactic acid that causes problems. This can cause some swelling or actually the lactate, but basically your body splits it right here at this red and yellow um, marker, splits that after about a quarter second, the bigger molecule, the lactate, can cause swelling, but really what your body usually does is it shuttles it back to the liver and it can reform this into more stored glucose called glycogen, so this is not a bad thing. We measure lactate because you can see how big the lactate is to this little free hydrogen ion, okay? This is what causes that jelly-legged fatigued feeling in your legs when you've run too fast, too quickly, okay? Or at the very end of your 5K race, if you've executed your kick correctly, right? Because that's when we want it to be there. You know, we've got no more race to run. This is what builds up in your body. If you remember from your chemistry class, um, your sophomore year in high school, you'll notice that you know that anything that has an H in, in, the, uh, in it, especially at the beginning of it, is going to have um, an acidity level. This causes the um, pH to drop, and this is what causes the problem eventually if the mitochondria cannot clear it in the electron transport chain. As acid accumulates, pH drops, right? Base, uh, I mean, excuse me, not base. Neutral is 7.0. Anything below that, which is being caused by an increased acidity, that drops pH. If you were to go the other way and you have a bigger number than 7, and then it's a, a base type thing, and that's part of what your body's going to end up doing to, comp to, to help um, compensate for dropping pH levels from free um, hydrogen ions zooming around because we're doing things like extensive tempo. pH drops causing acidosis. Acidosis just means acidity um, below the, the neutrality of 7.0. This acidosis and it causes fatigue due to reduced enzyme effectiveness. So your body uses enzymes to create things, make things happen. 
um, the reduced pH that comes from the drop from the uh, acid being floating around there it makes enzymes not work nearly as well they're not effective when they're acidic and it also what causes a lot of muscle pain or that jelly leg feeling and and fatigue that happens in your muscles and last thing on this if workouts are too intense acid levels spike and that can cause mitochondrial damage and poor adaptation. So if we didn't do this transition workout, this extensive tempo workout that is pretty moderate, as you saw from that, if we try to jump right to special endurance one without any of the adaptations that came in between, acid levels are going to spike, right? It's just gonna be like all of a sudden, boom, and your body has not experienced this. And all of a sudden your mitochondria are just flooded with acid mitochondria do not like being around too much acid they use it for energy production okay for the cells but if they are just saturated in acid it can damage and eventually kill the mitochondria so if we just flood all of our cells with all of this by skipping all these steps it's gonna hurt our mitochondria and that can actually hurt aerobic development as i mentioned in the slide before you don't do these in between steps or if you do too much of extensive tempo you do you know four or five of them in a row for some reason it's going to damage your mitochondria plain and simple okay we don't want that we don't want the workouts to be too intense so the acid levels spike and if you do that your body doesn't know how to make heads or tails it's like well crap i just got something i'm not used to i just got flooded with acid what am i supposed to do with this adaptation becomes poor it's not as effective as we want so we can do better than that we can do much better than just throwing all these free hydrogen ions let's see how we can actually um do this in a more effective way so a really effective way an important way of, of looking at um what kind of acidity level do we want to eventually get ready to, for is by looking at what the actual acidity level is in the various races so um we're really just looking at the 5k it's the one that's highlighted here and this is on average for a trained athlete right if you have somebody who's not trained at all it's going to be very different because they're not going to even like if you had somebody who'd never run before and you had them try and run a 400 they're not going to get to 24 millimoles of lactate their body won't let them get that high right um, so this is for somebody who's trained and basically distance and intensity and it's millimoles of lactate um, produced so that sounds like a crazy number basically the higher the more acid um, really it's the more lactate that is in the uh, in the body but remember the lactate and the acid come in a one to run ratio so if we measure one we can measure the other so again as I mentioned before you just sitting here watching this presentation have 0 0.8 to 0 0.18 millimoles of lactate. Again, that shows the fact that the anaerobic glycolytic system never turns on. Um, it, it's never off. Um, even when you're sleeping, you're producing energy that's causing acid, and then your mitochondria are taking it and they're making energy um, using the electron transport chain and, and Krebs cycle. So never think that this turns off, and this just kind of shows that lactic threshold, that, that area where it does start to accumulate is 2.5. Okay, it's about that you can improve that with training it's going to be lower than that again for somebody who's not trained 10k is at 7.5 makes sense here that the 5k is going to be at higher intensity than either of those but if you're running a 3200 meter you're going to be a little bit um higher in acid and then of course the 400 is kind of the classic highest level of lactate you can get on a track is with that one right there so this is what we're trying to target nine millimoles of lactate significantly above lactic threshold but significantly below 400 meters all out or even if you're dealing with you know and as i mentioned this and that's not the, the point of this presentation the reason why your 800 meter runners or your 8 15 or 1600 meter runners really can only train part of the time with your 3200 meter or 3200 meter 1600 meter runners there's just too much difference there but the way that you train a 3200 meter runner is pretty similar to the way you're going to train a 5k runner um, if you've noticed in these presentations and things i've talked about in the past the training is fairly similar between these two so let's see how this actually plays out if we're looking at this so our goal is to get them them being either yourself or who you're training if you're a coach used to race specific acidity levels so they can develop the specific ability to buffer this acid concentration and i have that um that that phrasing is really important there right specific ability to buffer this acid um, concentration because no human can actually tolerate acid accumulation in muscles and that's kind of what people usually say oh we have to get them to tolerate the acid no human can do that okay it's just not possible um, the analogy that was first presented to me and I think makes this make a lot of sense is 
you can't tolerate fire either, no matter how many times you're exposed to it. Your muscles, the mitochondria, the enzymes can't tolerate acid no matter how many times they're exposed to it, okay? You turn on the stove, you're in the stove top of your house, and you go and put your hand on that stove top, you're going to get burnt. And if you do it every day for a year, your hand is still going to get burnt every time you put your hand on it. Maybe it's very slightly different if you develop a huge callus, but it's still going to burn you every single time in a very, very short period. What do we need to do to prevent that? Well, I mean, this is obviously a weird analogy. You would not do that. But if you go and put an oven mitt on and then touch that stovetop, you can handle that for a while, probably until the oven mitt catches on fire and then it's all used up and then you're going to have the same issue. That's what we want to think about here. How can we put an oven mitt between the areas of our cells that cannot be exposed to this acid? That's why I say we're trying to buffer that acid. We're not trying to tolerate it. We're trying to buffer it by putting something in between the acid and what can be damaged by the acid. The mitochondria, the enzymes, the cells in general. That's what we're trying to do here with this type of training. So keep that analogy in mind. We are not tolerating. That's impossible. We're trying to buffer it. We're trying to put something in between really to neutralize it. But it's the same idea again of putting on that oven mitt. Um, however... Too much acid too fast, um, that can damage mitochondria. I talked about this previously, reducing aerobic energy production, so we need to slowly introduce this to them. Okay, again, them being yourself or who you're training. Extensive tempo is a great way to do this for a bunch of reasons, right? Um, as we said, we don't want to just dump a bunch of acid into their cells. We have to slowly introduce it, and extensive tempo is going to slowly put a little bit of this acid into their system, just above VO2 max pace, aerobic power pace, so that the body said, huh, I really didn't like that. I got burnt by this acid. I better start to develop something so that doesn't happen. So that the next time you can go a little more intense and a little more intense than extensive tempo. Again, this is sort of a bridge, okay? I'm um, doing this just above aerobic power, meaning acid levels will be just above what they're already used to, okay? So you've done those VO2 max tests. You've done the VO2 max intervals. They're already almost used to this intensity. We're just kicking it up just a little bit so they can develop a little bit more of an ability to buffer this acid now that we're going to start really increasing it um, as we get toward the end of the season. Okay, why does the anaerobic glycolytic system improve? Why do we develop this metaphorical oven mitt to buffer the acid? What's going on here? Okay, so increased um, a, um, acid buffering capacity after exposure to acid, the body stores various products to neutralize it. Okay, reducing or delaying muscle fatigue. Okay. This is sometimes called acid tolerance, as I mentioned, but this isn't actually what's happening. We're buffering the actual agents. What are some of these acid buffering capacities? Well, hemoglobin in the blood. You develop more blood over a bunch of training. Hemoglobin is actually a base. And having that, and, and your body is eventually, after the cells get overwhelmed, it's going to dump the, um, the acid into your blood, and the hemoglobin can help um, buffer that. Sodium bicarbonate, you may know that if you've had a sour stomach or, or um, heartburn or something like that, you take this because it neutralizes that acid. Your body can store this in the cells. This is probably the most effective of those, the oven mitt metaphor that I was just talking about. Your body actually stores this in the cells, okay, so that it puts something in between that and the acid. And the blood plasma proteins, again, this is all dealing more with the blood. So all of those things can collectively increase the acid buffering capacity. The most important one being right there in the middle of the sodium bicarbonate, okay? So um, that's really the biggest thing here for the anaerobic glycolytic system improving. You're also going to have some increased um, muscle strength, which we started with alactic and, and hill runs. Um, you're going to have more anaerobic enzymes. Your body can produce more energy anaerobically, and it has these buffering capacity. Once the buffering capacity is there, the enzymes can actually be utilized more. You have more of them. They're more effective. They're more active. The volume's higher. That's going to improve the anaerobic glycolytic system's energy production. And this is something we talked about in... Um, a video that we did on um, muscle fiber composition. Your body actually has two different pores for the different muscle fibers that allow acid to either come into the cell or go out of the cell. As you are rapidly producing acid with the anaerobic glycolytic system in cells, they can develop more pores so it can dump more of the acid. You know, it, it's going to neutralize what it can with the sodium bicarbonate, but it's going to develop these cells to remove or dump acid into the blood. So hopefully that it can be carried somewhere else where it can be used, maybe uh, an, a more aerobic type cell so it can use it 
um, in the, the mitochondria, um, or the sodium bicarbonate, um, excuse me, the hemoglobin can, can buffer the, the, the plasma proteins. Hopefully we don't get too much of an acidic um, um, response there. This is the most important part there, especially the sodium bicarbonate. There's other ones, but that's the most commonly known one that your body stores. Um, and these other things are sort of side benefits. The athlete's also going to be getting older. The older you are, um, after about age 16, when you start to reach close to full maturity, that's when your body can actually tolerate more of this just naturally. Um, it's going to develop more of this idea of um, buffering. It can do more of that storage and everything. Okay, here's the important thing. Adaptations improving the anaerobic glycolytic system are mostly biochemical in nature. Okay? The sodium bicarbonate or the buffering storing capacity inside the cells being the probably 80% of this. It's most of this adaptation that's dealing with here. Increased strength, the end, all those things are important, but this really is the critical factor leading to increased acid buffering capacity. This has a peaking window of nine to 11 weeks. Keep that number in mind. And then you can hold it for about another week or two, okay? If this is the timetable we're dealing with here because of this, if you go, if you go out of that, if you decide, well, I'm gonna start my, my glycolytic training you know, 15 weeks before the state meets, 16 weeks. I want to do it at the end of general prep. This is going to eventually drop. You're going to drop anaerobic fitness through no um, no issues with your training other than when the timing was because your body's ability to especially store this product gets reduced after this period of time for whatever reason. Um, and that's, you know, at sea level and things like that. For some reason, the body doesn't store this nearly well enough if you're at altitude. And by altitude, I mean 1,500 meters or higher for some reason. It's the reason why a lot of people do their, if they can, they do their aerobic workouts at altitude over 1,500 meters. And then they, they try and drive down to be lower for their anaerobic training or interval training or any of those type of higher intensity things because your body will store it when it's doing it at those levels. But for some reason, that at altitude, it doesn't happen. Doesn't work, matter for us here in Tampa, Florida. As I mentioned, we're almost below sea level where we are. So this is that timetable we're dealing with. So keep this in mind. And we talked about we're starting the timetable in this 9 to 11 week peaking with, again, about two weeks added onto the back end here. So keep that in mind as we go further into this presentation. So I feel uh, I feel like we covered a lot of ground here talking about you know specific prep why this um, workout sort of starts the window on peaking and things like that but let's really focus in really specifically on these designed adaptations and bring all the pieces together here in one nice slide as I mentioned um, in, in some of these previous slides so. Um, Design adaptation of extensive tempo, we want to start the peaking window for the anaerobic glycolytic system. Mentioned it before, but as we said here, we need 9 to 11 weeks to peak. Many people don't start this work soon enough in the cross country season. I talk about the idea of starting it too early. Most people start it too late, right? Most people, you know, you've got your summer conditioning, you know, you have whatever limitations you have with either your high school association or whatever it is you're, you're training with that might limit what you can and can't do. And then usually you start school or right around that time frame, your official practice, your official season starts. That usually is right around 9 to 11 weeks or more like 12 to 13, as we said, there's a little bit on the back end where, you know, you need to be starting this in order to be maximized by the end. A lot of times people are like, well, I need to get four to five weeks or whatever, you know, I'm bringing new kids and things like that. And yet you need to be careful with new kids. But, you know, those ones that have been doing all this stuff through the summer, they need to be starting this at the proper time and most people don't start it soon enough they might some people even wait you know the last maybe month of the season before they start doing it and you'll see some improvement but you'll never see all the improvement you need nine to eleven weeks to peak and then you can hold it for a couple okay so keep that in mind too i know a lot of it like i said has been talking about you know delay the start but don't delay it too much you know it's the goldilocks effect right it, it ha just right is just right keep that in mind this is usually around the first week of official practice. I already said that in my 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 yammering here. Um, transition to more intense work. Here's another designed adaptation of extensive tempo. Um, we talked about it. We want to get to intensive tempo, special endurance one, special endurance two. Should have flipped that. Really, intensive tempo is the least um, intense. Special endurance two is a little bit slower but longer, and this is short and fast. 
um, in the glycolytic system. We want to get to these. And as I mentioned, I think there's really a way to blend intensive tempo with special endurance one and special endurance two to kind of safely get to those other ones that I'll talk about in previous videos. But we need to get ready for this more intense work. And that's what extensive tempo does. Starting this with this more moderate work will prepare the athlete for faster paces later in the training year, right? We talked about it. They're going to start storing some acid buffering agents so that they don't get all this acid just dumped on them at once and, and hurt their mitochondria or their aerobic development they've been doing through all this time. And they're going to better adapt. So this little bit is going to help them to start storing this so they can be ready for intensive tempo, special one and special two. Um, and then you've hopefully been doing throughout general prep short hill intervals and then you transition to medium hills for a couple weeks before you started doing this and hopefully you've been doing your alactic work throughout the summer your fly 30s this is going to prep them for faster running earlier um, this this uh, this earlier in the training year is going to prep them for this type of faster running that we're dealing with here so that's the idea of even in general prep you didn't get too far away from fast running right you did alactic work you did your short hill intervals that became medium hill intervals so it's not just, you know, they've been getting used to now the, the acid slowly here with, with extensive tempo, but we've also done this groundwork here by doing these faster type workouts throughout your general prep. Those two things come together so that you can eventually get to intensive tempo, special one and special two. And this is not really what we're dealing with in this presentation, but I do want to mention it at least briefly. This workout can serve to hold anaerobic fitness, okay? This is more important for the competition phase, you know, two days before the state meet. Extensive tempo is a great workout. It holds serves so that all those enzymes stay active. The acid uh, buffering capacity stays at its peak. This can hold anaerobic fitness. You're not really at the end of the season going to be improving with this, but it can hold serve. As we said, we're trying to hold that after the 9 to 11 weeks. Can we hold it for 12 to 13 weeks here? You're still going to be doing fast work in that, that peaking um, phase where you're trying to hold it, but this can also serve in a week that maybe, you know, your state meets maybe on Saturday. You do something hard on, say, Monday or possibly Tuesday, and then you could do this extensive tempo workout on Wednesday or possibly Thursday if you waited till Tuesday. It's sort of a placeholder end of the season. It does just enough, right? Um, placeholder to keep anaerobic fitness high, holding peak for that additional one to two weeks. And it's also a great way to get anaerobic workout two days before an important meet. So, you know, and I'll talk about this when we get to the um, the hypothetical um, macro cycle, which, I mean, uh, yeah, macro cycle here with specific prep. If you see a, a meet that's really important and you want to do something that's somewhat quality, especially early in specific prep, um, you don't want to hit them really hard. Maybe it's a meet on your regional course or just a meet that's really important to you that you want them to be a little bit rested for. Specific prep meets usually are not that important, but if there's one you just want to take a little tiny bit off and you don't want to hit them with, you know, uh, uh, an intensive tempo or a special endurance one or two workout two days before, or even like a tempo workout or interval, something like that. This is a good thing, great way to get an anaerobic workout in about two days before an important meet um, is a good way to do this. So those are the things we're doing here with extensive tempo. Um, the training design, how do we set this up now? Okay, I would say one per microcycle and early specific prep through, uh, and you kind of, as I said, and then throughout as needed. As we'll see in this, um, the, when we get to the, the calendar here in a second, I'm only gonna have one locked in as I'm definitely doing one here. Maybe another one, and I'll mention that reason why, but it's kind of that throughout as needed because there might be a meat or two in there that you wanna be just a little bit rested for. Specific prep microcycles also tend to be longer in general prep. As you saw, everything was being repeated every week, every seven days, because there's fewer things to do in general prep. Well, now that we're in specific prep, we've added a new workout type, extensive tempo. Um, we're going to add some more workout types with intensive tempo, special one, special two. We're still doing hill work here for a while. We're still doing fly 30. All those things we've been doing. So specific prep microcycle is going to be longer. So just as you hear me say microcycle now, and it's been easy to kind of wrap your mind around with seven days, it's not going to be seven days anymore. It's going to be more like nine days um, as you're kind of getting through this. I'll do a whole video where I talk about how you can kind of wrap your head around that because it's a little bit challenging at first, um, but just keep that in mind. The microcycle is longer now because you have more things to do. Okay, so these are done as intervals. Okay, intervals meaning incomplete recovery. You're not giving them full recovery between reps the same way you were doing this in your hill intervals, 
same way you were doing this in your um, your VO2 max aerobic power intervals. You're not letting them sit around all day. You're not giving them 10 minutes in between. We actually want them to have a, a slightly tighter rest here again because of the acid that we're trying to elicit the response in from your um, from your cells. This does allow for a larger amount of higher intensity work. If you did an extensive tempo and you went straight through, and I'm going to recommend about maybe up to two miles of this, it would it would it would basically be impossible at the intensity I'm saying because I'm going to recommend it be faster than VO2 max. You can't go faster. You can't go further than two miles with VO2 max unless you have a fantastic um, runner whose two mile pace is significantly under ten minutes. You're probably not going to be dealing with that. Um, in, in any regularity, okay? So you're going to be able to get more work done by do, by breaking it up as intervals. And actually for this, it's actually going to allow the acid to continue to develop and, and be a side benefit or actually the main benefit of what we're dealing with here. So you can do this on the track or in the park with grass. My preference is a second, in a park with grass. And when you do it, in, in, in a park with grass, um, it's a great way to start working barefoot running. I talked about in a video on strength um, training how barefoot running helps to develop specific strength. Okay, in a distance runner, you want to be able to do that push off. This is a good way to start introducing barefoot runs. You should be doing this with some plyometric stuff and things like that earlier on in the season. This is the first core chunk of a workout where you would really want to be doing some barefoot running and start introducing it so that when they're doing intense, you know, special one, and, or excuse me, special two, and um, intensive tempo later in the year, they're a little bit more used to it. Um, so you're getting this extra strength um, work going on here. So you can do it at the track. And if you're going to do this in a park with grass, and I'll talk about this in a whole video probably on barefoot running, don't do this once or twice a year and say you did barefoot running. You got to do this regularly about once a week or once per microcycle. However, um, you can actually get it in. You need to do this often, maybe two to three times a month um, for this to be effective. And this is a good way to start doing it. The rest on this is short because it's not that intense, right? So say about 90 seconds or so. I usually say 90 seconds to two minutes. You don't want to get to three, okay? because we don't want the alactic system to recharge. We talked about how this is the fastest energy producing system and alactic workouts, you give yourself at least three minutes, four would be better so that you can use this and not produce acid. We're trying to, excuse me, accumulate acid in this. So we don't want the alactic system to recharge as the workout goes on. So the first one, they're gonna have full access to their alactic system, you give them 90 seconds, it's not really gonna be very much recharge and then as they go on, they're gonna have to be relying more on the anaerobic glycolytic system. So this is a workout that it's going to you know, continue to help them as they go into it if you keep this rest fairly tight, you know, being this short here. We want this slight buildup in acid to happen. That's an important training um, adaptation from this workout. The extent, it, 400 meters, I think, just sort of works. You could do it, you know, just based on time, you know, run this amount, but I think that if you give them, um, 400 meters at a specific intensity, it tends to work out. I think if you try to go longer, if you're trying to go 600 meters, it, it can start to be a little bit more of an intense day than you really want. You really want this to be an easy way to do it. But if you start doing like say 200 meters or 300 meters, like you might see for you know um, a sprinter or something like that, trying to do some some extensive tempo, it doesn't seem to be long enough to really do anything. They've just these types of kids have such a strong aerobic system. You might not really be accumulating any acid. Um, because they just have such a well-developed aerobic system. So I I'd say 400 meters is probably perfect for this if you're looking for it. But you can play around with it and see what works for you. It's what really seems to work for, for us. Total volume between one and two miles. I like six reps. I like a mile and a half with this. It seems to be just the right amount where they come out saying, you know, that was, that was good. The last one, maybe just a little bit, but they don't usually come out just dragging on the floor from this. Um, one mile, they're usually like, I haven't even done anything yet, coach. Um, when a couple times I've done it to two, it got a little bit too much of a demanding workout that I was looking for for this moderate introduction. So I like six reps, play around with it, figure out what works for your situation. Intensity is moderate, okay? Think VO2 max plus, as we talked about from that energy continuum, okay? Don't deal with aerobic power VO2 max like they've been doing in their intervals. Think about the long end of that range. So we're talking 102 to like 108% VO2 max, which I don't, I don't like calculating it that way. I think it's just a little bit too much for something that's only 400 meters and this kind of thing, and it's really on pace and feel. So I'll tell you what I do. I usually have them target their VVO2 max pace, okay? So whatever their VO2 max is, I tell them what that would be broken up into a 400, but I take off three to five seconds. So basically four seconds per 400 meters faster 
than their current VO2 max or two mile pace and you've hopefully been doing um, regular pace checks um, as you're doing this a VO2 max test so you know what that is. Basically this is going to be what? 16 seconds per mile faster than their VO2 max pace. To me that seems like you know on average so say actually it's 12 to 20 seconds. That's VO2 max plus to me. It's a little bit faster they're going to accumulate the acid but they're not going to be overwhelmed with it. If that what I just said here doesn't make sense here's another way of thinking about it. If you have somebody who has a VVO2 max of 5 flat, they ran 10 flat in a, a VO2 max test 2 miles, and so their VVO2 max the velocity at which they reach VO2 max is 5, their range would be 70 to 72, right? Because VO2 max would be 75 seconds per 400, that's 5 minute pace, so take off 3 to 5 seconds, I'd say for that person, 70 to 72, hit these 400s in 70 72. They're going to say, wow, that's walking, coach. I can do that all day. And they can for six reps very easily with this tight window. And they can get, get the work they need and get out without anybody getting hurt. Recovery should be active. Okay. Easy aerobic work allows for acid levels to stay moderate and actually enhance aerobic growth. Um, you know, I talk about this in general prep that if you, you link intervals with um, active recovery, it can make it into more of an aerobic day. But actually, what it also does is the moderate aerobic work helps clear the acid because it keeps the mitochondria kind of churning at high levels, right? So it's not going to let the acid levels get too high. It's going to allow for this work not to get too too intense. Um, that's the whole thing. If you run a 400 as fast as you can and then just stand there, it will burn. It will hurt so badly. If you try and, you know, if you just jog a little bit afterwards, it's going to get out of your system a little bit faster to where you could do another 400 or another 400. We're not dealing with fast 400 here, but that's the same intent. Do this with your kids if they don't believe you. If you're one that's always kind of done static recovery, you know, have them do the, uh, the active recovery. I think they will find it is much, much easier. And what I actually do with my group, because they just know active recovery, they have to do it. Usually once, sometime in their training life, I have them do this where they're doing a faster workout, not something like this, but special one, special two. And on the second to last rep, the new group, I don't let them move at the end. The ones that are just like, yeah, yeah, coach, whatever, uh, active recovery, whatever you say there, but I don't really believe it. Just once, have them at the end of the rep, just sit or just stand there. Don't move until the next rep and have them do the last rep. Just do it just once. They'll never, ever, ever argue with you with that on that point again because it will hurt like no tomorrow. Um, do it with yourself too. Just understand that's part of the reason behind this in this case. When we're dealing with aerobic, it's going to have that um, slight enhancement in aerobic growth, um, anything over 20 minutes, and this definitely will be if you do it correctly, but also for the fact that we want to keep the, the acid level moderate. There might even be a reason where you want them to have static recovery. If you're dealing with a, a 400 meter runner, an 800 meter runner that really has to develop a, a ability to buffer a lot of acid you might do and I've done this when I focus more on 800 meter runner training in, in years ago there might be a reason why you might want to do that but not for right now definitely not when you're just trying to introduce this okay so moderate intensity with these workouts but there will be some accumulation of acid as we said that's what we want because of the increased demand from the anaerobic glycolytic system usually fatigue on these days is not bad at all considering the moderate accumulation of acid it's not that fast it's not that much it's, you know the rest is short um, but it's not that bad this means you're going um, what you're going to set out you're going this means you're you're doing what you set out to do that was a really weird way of, of me writing that but you're, you're accomplishing your mission if it's not too bad okay just start introduce you're just introducing them to this acid okay it would be really bad if you did this workout perfectly designed after everything you did in the summer and they said wow coach that killed me i'm i could barely get through it that would mean they're really not in shape anaerobically at all which would be very surprising i've never really had a situation where that happened um if that did happen again maybe you went to the two mile extent when they weren't quite ready for it or maybe you know they were not doing the paces maybe they're going way too fast maybe they're going more intensive tempo or something like that you want them again to come from this being like that was that was good you know the last one was a little bit challenging but it was no issue hitting all my paces i never needed more rest everything was good that's what you want we're just introducing them to it with this workout so let's see how this actually plays out if we look at a calendar 
Okay, so this is our fictitious uh, macro cycle. I'm going to go um, not only looking at specific prep here, but I want to show you that this makes sense in terms of the timing, that 9 to 11 weeks with that little bit of um, about 1 to 2 weeks on the back end. Um, specific prep, I'm going to recommend here, um, specific prep 1, if you did this lined up everything all the way that we talked about, you're not going to have hills in this first week. We're on a two-week break from hills. This is the great, you know, the Monday, you know, basically day 1 or day 2, however you look at this. Um, of week one of specific prep, giving this workout, okay? Telling them, hey, I'm changing phases on you guys here. Show them that you're changing phases. Don't say you're doing specific prep and then do the exact same thing you did before. You didn't do anything if, you, if that was the case. So extensive tempo here, five to six. Again, I like six, but you might have some newer kids that can only do five. 400s on grass, rest 90 seconds to two minutes after a bounding circuit. I'll talk about that in, in subsequent videos, but also, and actually I have talked about that in videos, I'll, it's in the description down below. I'll mention that here as we wrap things up. And then a good three miles in the back in about 25 minutes, seven miles on that day, you didn't lose any volume, okay? And then as I mentioned um, here in August and then in September, I don't have any more specifically planned. You can see we've got the medium hill intervals, from previous videos. The only thing that, um, if I were actually doing this for myself, originally this weekend right here was going to be off and we were going to do a VO2 max test. We come to find that um, the course that's going to be our regional site host is going to have a meet on this day. I definitely want to get into that. Um, it's the same place that we had our regional meet last year, but I've had some new kids jump onto our varsity team and I want them to see that. So at regionals, there's no issue. So this is probably going to become a weekend where I race and I'll probably move this and take something else out. Um, of our training year and a good day to do this if, especially if you want them to have good feelings on something like a regional meet course i'm probably going to do an extensive tempo workout right here on the 27th so i'm going to have extensive tempo here 10 days later i'm going to have something probably earlier this week that's going to be um, a little bit faster more on the intensive tempo side now that i've done a little bit of it or something like that but for my situation that's why i'm saying you you want to do one early on just to get them used to it and then you kind of have to plug and play this for what makes sense for your situation. So for me, I would put one here, okay? Third week of specific prep, which goes into this right, that's not right, goes into this right here. I'll have a medium hill workout. I may or may not have um, extensive tempo, probably won't, probably will have something faster um, here. So as I said, you kind of have to plug and play. If I decided Spanish River is another meet that I want to get ready for, I might do an extensive tempo here. This is a meet that we're having on our district meet course um, in Florida districts. Um, it's not the most challenging to get out of because you have 19 teams in the district and the top eight get out. So usually you don't have to be crazy for it. So I don't really care all that much about this one other than just seeing the course. I'm probably not going to do what I said I was going to do with the regional meet course on this one. And that would end specific prep. So that's how you have to do this. This is a workout that's a good plug and play. Where does it make sense as well as that first introduction um, as you're going through it. Now let's make sure that we're on point in terms of our timing. It's going to count back. As I said, our state meet in Florida is scheduled for November 7th. If yours is a different week, you might want to um, change this up. Um, I also kind of have on here things like Foot Locker South Regionals, which you may have somebody getting ready for, but this is what we really want to peak for states. So we've got one week here, going to October, two, three, three weeks of, of comp, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so this would be the front end of the peaking, nine, 10, 11. We talked about nine to 11 weeks, and then you can hold for one to two, okay? Possibly three, depending on if you do everything right. So that's why I think this makes sense. This is 12 weeks from the state meet. For us in Florida, if we start specific prep work here with this first extensive tempo workout. So if we talk about nine to 11 to get to that peak, and then you can hold it for about two. I've given myself a little bit of wiggle room with this. It may get to the point where I do another extensive tempo workout in here and don't do something crazy hard because I might think, well, the team I've got, you know, is 100% solid. We should have no problem getting out of regionals, getting into the state meet. Or it may be that I want to make sure that they're definitely peaking for the regional meet. You kind of have to play around with that in your situation, but this is kind of a good starting point. And I can adjust from this based on how the team develops um, throughout all of the uh, the training to, to this point so that I can, you know, kick the can down the road one more time and make sure that they're super peak for states or have them peak for that regional meet. It kind of depends on you and your situation. So that's how this all fits in, where you would put this in specific prep and why it makes sense to do this here in terms of the peaking window 
for this energy system. So let's go ahead and wrap things up by getting back to the presentation. Okay, so let's briefly look at what this pair is great with and what this workout pairs terribly with, and then we'll hit on some key points. So you just saw um, this pair is great with a, a good added cooldown, about two to three miles. Um, the distance here, it's really for the, the top end boys that I work with, and then the, uh, the secondary boys and the, um, or the less trained boys at this point, and then the, uh, the girls that I work with. Usually three miles is gonna be about 25 minutes. That's why that other time was on there. Um, you want to do that at an easy pace, a heart rate of 120 to 150, not the aerobic threshold pace they do on recovery runs or long runs, um, but you know, just do it based on you know, that easy intensity if they're checking their heart rate at their neck. You're looking for 20 to 25 beats in 10 seconds if they don't have a good heart rate monitor. Immediately after, we'll add to their overall aerobic development. Okay, we typically get about seven miles on those days. The whole key for this day is starting to prime the anaerobic glycolytic system, but we can't forget the aerobic system is still king. So if we can get some aerobic development on the back end, that's great. And also, this is going to remove any of that acid that accumulated so that we, we had a little bit of an exposure, but we get it out of the system so we can come back the next day, reducing soreness for the next day. So great way to, to get some extra aerobic work and make sure you're ready for the next day by getting that acid out of the system. Relaxation techniques, I've talked about this in previous videos. Um, after your, you know, your cool down, you're gonna wanna do some good stretching. That's a relaxation technique. And then one thing that I really like to do, um, just have, find a place where you can have your legs propped up. You're lying on your back on the ground. Um, if you can find a good bench where you can just kind of have your legs sitting there with no muscle energy at all, that was what I find to be the, the most relaxing here. But you can also find a wall or a fence or something like that, a tree, something where you can prop your legs up. For about five to 10 minutes, legs up, eyes closed, just relax. It helps bring your heart rate down. It helps bring everything back to normal, especially on this first day that they're having acid accumulation. It's, it's a really important thing to help bring them back down to baseline. Icing, something you can also do. Um, there's some benefit to icing after a day like this. Okay, the acid accumulates. That's one of the things that, you know, what happens is not actually the icing that helps get things like acid and inflammation out of your system. What it really is, is that constricts your blood vessels. And then when you get out of the ice and you get warmed up, um, the blood vessels immediately open up and it's like immediate healing all the way through here too to get that out. Okay, so if you wanted to ice, it would be good on days like this. I personally have not done icing in about two years. The reason being, everything that you get from icing for about 10 minutes, you get from that long cool down, okay? However, the long cool down, you get aerobic benefit and you get obviously no aerobic benefit from sitting in an ice bath. So if you do the long cool down and then get in an ice bath, you're not really adding anything to it afterwards other than time to your workout. So I would only do this, I've had kids every once in a while that'll say they wanna do it and if it's a mental thing or maybe they think it does physically help them a little bit when they're a little bit run down, that's fine. I just don't make it to where, hey, everybody, we're icing today, okay? I haven't done that for a number of years. Um, there is benefit to it, just kind of play that you know, as it is. I don't wanna use any more of their time than I absolutely have to, so I've gone away from systematic icing, but this would be the kind of day that if you wanted to ice, it would make sense. What does it not pair well with, okay? Lifting and strength work after. I talked about this um, and you saw it on the, the fictitious um, plan. You want to, you could do bounding on the front end, plyometric type work, the same way you do plyometric work on alactic runs or um, hill runs beforehand, beforehand only because they've not had their muscles being fatigued by the acid. You do it afterwards, you're not gonna get what you want, right? You won't get what you want from these lifting and strength work because they, they can't, they're fatigued. They're not getting as much out of it. If you want it to be highly demanding strength type work to actually add to what they're doing, okay, it should not be after these workouts, really. It, it just doesn't make any sense. The same way you wouldn't do this on a tempo day or a, a, a tempo run, um, a lactic threshold run or a VO2 max run or something like that. It doesn't make sense. Their muscles are fatigued from the acid um, in this case, and you're not gonna get what you want. It's basically a waste of time afterwards, okay? So if it makes you feel better, you can do it. You're not really hurting yourself. You're just wasting your time, basically. And if you do this systematically over a, a, a long period of time, you probably lose strength because they just can't give you know everything you need into it for it to actually work. But as I mentioned, some good plyometric work before can prime you for that workout. It's a good thing. I like to do it. Um, if you can make it work for your situation, adds maybe about 15 minutes to your warm up, 10 to 15 minutes, I would definitely recommend it. I do that myself. So let's take away some key points from this presentation before we wrap things up. 
Extensive tempo workouts start the process in a couple of different ways, including starting the clock on the peaking window of the 9 to 11 weeks by creating acid accumulation in a safe way early in specific prep. Okay, They start the clock there. They start the process. They also serve to prep the runner for more intense work later on. Start the process for more intense work. Good. You won't do many of these, but they serve as an important bridge. And I talked about this on the medium hill workout video where I recommended three to five in a year. You, they're, they're a bridge. They get you from where you are to where you want to be. You don't want to stay on a bridge very long. That's sort of the metaphor that I went to, right? You try to get off a bridge as quickly as you can safely, right? You don't jump off in the middle. You have to go through the actual process, but you don't hang around on the bridge, you know, most of the time. Most bridges, you're just trying to get from point A to point B. That's where you want to think of an extensive tempo workout. They get you from where you are to where you want to get in a safe, effective way. Think of it that way. That's what an extensive tempo workout is. Rest should be tight. So the intensity will be moderate. If you gave them 10 minutes, they could go faster, but we're only giving them 90 seconds to about two minutes. So you won't get so you don't get the benefit of the alactic system. That's the important thing. Don't make it three minutes, which puts an increased strain on the anaerobic glycolytic system. That's what we're trying to train here. Foot strength can be worked on these. Intervals on grass barefoot will start creating specific strength needed for distance runners getting ready for the cross country 5K. As I said, I'll do a whole video series on barefoot running, but again, just to prove to, to highlight this point, if you're gonna do this once or twice a year, I'm not saying extensive tempo workout, I'm saying barefoot running because you can do it with faster work later on if you only like i'll do it once or twice just don't don't do it at all just do this on the track if you do want to make this a systematic thing to actually increase foot strength then you need to make this something that you do regularly you know a couple times you know probably at least three times a month something like that and this is a good way to start doing it so they're ready for it when you do more intense work again it's starting the process on all these things including the foot strength process and last thing, end with a good cool down routine, going two to three miles at the end, stretching using relaxation techniques can help you bring back to baseline after these first acid producing um, accumulating days. Um, so you can be ready for whatever you have next in specific prep. Um, so that's the end of this video. We'll talk about some other things later on, like intensive tempo, special one, special two. I'll do a video where I show you how you can look at a nine day cycle and an easy way to get your mind around. It's a two step process for me looking at a calendar and then getting out a piece of paper and writing it all down to make sure I'm getting everything that I need. Um, so it might help you as you start doing this yourself. And then we're also going to go through and talk about how those other workouts we did in general prep, how those also fit in so we can fill in our whole fictitious macro cycle there looking at specific prep. So look forward to those over the next few days. Um, if you like this video, please think about liking or subscribing. It really helps the channel grow. If you uh, found this helpful, maybe share it around. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments down below and I'll throw a bunch of videos down in the description that I mentioned in this video. And until next time, this has been Coach ETV.